Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR podcast brought to you by RaceForThePrize.com. More Talladega podcasts. This one will be Xfinity series related. And I know it's redundant at times, but maybe you just love Talladega. Maybe you just love DFS NASCAR or possibly you're new. If you are, welcome to the channel. Let's have some fun. My job is to make Fantasy NASCAR easy for you, save you time, let you have more fun. And if you appreciate that, like, subscribe, share, leave tips, Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, or get your hands on this sheet that's going to help you out. You probably are not interested in buying what's left of the April package, so if you buy the May package, 30 bucks, I'll throw in Talladega, and I will also throw in Dover because I'm a nice guy because I want you here. Because I think if you see the sheets and start using the sheets and saving the time, having fun, you'll stick with me for the season, pay for the 3Ds, diapers, daycare, and Nikki D's. You support my family, and I'll help you the best I can. What are we looking at today for the Xfinity Series? We know who wins. We know who has good finishes. But really what we want to know is who runs well or does well in DFS. End of the day, surviving wrecks, getting good finishes. What we as players at DraftKings want are fantasy points. Who scores fantasy points? Who is in optimal lineups? Although, remember, we're not necessarily trying to build the optimal lineup. We're trying to build the winning lineup. Talk about that in a second. Who scores in the top 10 in terms of DFS points? Not necessarily a real life top 10 because a Xfinity driver, and it's especially the case in the Xfinity series, a driver can get a top 10 at Talladega, but not be anywhere near the actual top 10 on the DFS scoreboard simply because that driver started up front, and finished up front. Whereas a driver who finishes 17th but started 36th is in the top 10 in DFS and is the better play at DraftKings and will be in the winning or optimal lineup. So that's what we'll focus on in this podcast is the fantasy implications, the fantasy perspective, and see who are the drivers that are scoring points more so than who's scoring good finishes. Who are the drivers that hit more often in EFS rather than who are the drivers that are good plate super speedway racers? And what teams are they? Are there specific teams that we can target? Well, too long didn't read. Everyone is in play. They're not, there isn't really a team, small mid-pack team that starts in the back that typically hits a lot more than the others. They're all on the board. So if you're not staying too long, like, subscribe, share. There's not really going to be a specific team that we are going to highlight when we're going to the back of the pack. When we're looking at our pool, speaking of back in the pack, I'm contractually obligated to mention to you my three principles, these core beliefs at super speedways, these tenements, commandments, if you will. There are three. They have held true and steadfast over the last decade at DraftKings and since the beginning of time. Rule number one, don't talk about fight. No, rule number one, stack in the back. We are maximizing place differential. And we'll also get a lot of finishing positions if your drivers survive, if your drivers make the right moves at the end. We don't always need chaos, but that always happens. Not all of them are going to make it. Not all of you will make it, but some of you will cross that finish line. Rule number two, 30 to 10 to win. And you may be able to dial that down a little bit in the Xfinity series, but generally we are targeting 50 fantasy points. So as you are stacking the back, Looking at that pool of drivers in the back, you're looking for drivers that can score around 50 fantasy points. If you don't envision the driver getting a 30 to 10, if you say, man, this guy ain't getting past 20th, then you either take them out of your pool or you dial down your ownership. And then last but not least, and maybe the most important rule, is that do not get hung up on trying to build the optimal lineup. Build the winning lineup. If you try to build the optimal lineup, you're going to chase drivers closer to the front. And while they could hit, and while they have hit, they don't hit at a high probability. Eh, I mean, it's okay in the Xfinity series. But there's much more risk involved. And you can play it safer and still win the GPP by chasing place differential. Almost always is the case that when we do get an optimal lineup with the driver starting close to the front, There is still a driver that finishes with a top 10 DFS score that started in the back and was a arguably less risky play. And that's not always the case, 
because a strong argument can be made that A.J. Allmendinger starting up front is safer than B.J. McLeod starting in the back. Definitely will listen to that argument. It's strong. But the safest way to play, the easiest way to play, and the most tried and true way to play is stack in the back, 30-10 to win, build the winning lineup. You don't have to get real cute and chase guys starting up the front. So we can see on the screen the rankings of optimal. I thought we weren't chasing optimal yet, but we're just giving you an idea. We can also look at top tens. You can see that on the right side of the screen. So it's ranking right now based on their percentage of optimal appearances. I thought we weren't chasing optimal. Yeah, okay, but if you want, you can simply look over here, columns DR through DW, and see what their top 10 rate was. So for example, AJ Allmendinger, 67% of the time, so eight times in his 12 races, he has scored a top 10 DFS score. So you can put your eyes wherever you want on the screen. You wanna look at the optimals, there you go. You wanna look at top 10 scores because you're just trying to build a winning lineup, there it is. And so we see 69% of the time, unbelievable. AJ Allmendinger, colleague, Optimal lineup, four times optimal Daytona, four times optimal at Talladega, three times optimal at Atlanta. And then you've got the one time where if you want to look at the top tens, you can add another. He's got a top 10, but probably wasn't in the optimal lineup. AJ Allmendinger, and he typically starts closer to the front. You want to chase AJ this weekend? I don't mind that at all. You do not have to, though. You just needed to build the winning lineup. If AJ is starting 10th or back, then yes, he's absolutely firmly in play. Because again, if we're going 30 to 10 to win, it's around 50 fantasy points. If he starts 10th and he finishes second, that's over 50 fantasy points. He's $11,000, but salary is not going to be an issue. 10th is an easy place to play AJ. As he creeps forward, it becomes a little more tricky, and I don't think you need to build the optimal. And I would say, I'll let him go. If he gets into the optimal, so be it. I'll take my chances elsewhere. Jordan Anderson next on our list. Not a huge sample size. We know he's been good in the trucks, nearly winning at Daytona once upon a time, 60% of the time. He's been optimal. 75% of the time, he gets a top 10 DFS score. Again, it's only four races, but three out of four, not bad for Anderson, not bad for his team. Parker Kligerman, one of the more cerebral assassins, one of the more thoughtful and intelligent drivers. No surprise, he is able to outsmart the system. 44% of the time, he's been optimal. 40% of the time, he's getting a top 10 five. And they're like, wait a second, shouldn't your top 10 percentage be higher than your optimal? Not necessarily. There's going to be builds where, I mean, I'm not going to go into that, but no, not necessarily. Let's just leave it at that. Garrett Smithley, 42% of the time. That one might surprise you. Ah, Smithley's good at super speedways. Anyone is good at super speedways. But hey, maybe this is going to call some attention to him. Maybe it's someone you want to circle around. Maybe it'll make you more encouraged to play a daughter car or a JD Motorsports car. Those are typically the race cars that he is in. And so if in 42% of the races, eight times, He's been an optimal pick, then you shouldn't be weary of playing a JD car or a daughter car. 55% of the time, he gets a top 10 DFS score. Austin Hill, no real surprise there. Those numbers are really inflated by Atlanta, where he has crushed. Daytona, Talladega has never been optimal. Talladega, he's never scored a top 10 DFS score. It's super speed racing. Do you want to lean into that? and fade him this week, that's fine. He is one of the few drivers that has scored an optimal performance while also starting on the pole. And he will likely start in the top five. And I will likely just let him go and say, I'm not trying to build the optimal lineup. If he is in it and he wins it, so be it. I'm gonna play the percentages and I'm gonna stack in the back. That is fine for me. Because say in the scenario that you don't win, but you would like to cash. If Austin Hill wrecks, then that line's not going to cash. 
if Garrett Smithley wrecks from 30th, then you're still in good shape. Obviously, we want to build winning lineups. Second case, we want to break even. Austin Hill, yeah. Can he get you to a winning lineup? Yes. Can Garrett Smithley get you to a winning lineup? Yes. Now, what if both wreck? Smithley's not going to hurt you as much starting in the back. It's only going to be about negative 10 place differential, whereas Austin Hill is going to throw about a negative 30 spot, and so your chances of at least breaking even are significantly impaired. You. I mean, you can weigh the consequences. I think both of them give you the same chance of building a winning lineup, but one gives you a significantly lower floor and significantly less of a chance of at least breaking even. And that's Austin Hill. And so I will not really be targeting Austin Hill unless, for whatever reason, he is starting in the back. Parker Retzlaff. Been with various teams, now with Anderson. Our motorsports in the past, again, highlighting the teams, probably not the biggest of deals. The equipment's going to be fine, although we have seen some of these mid-pack cars struggle at times throughout a race, but usually by the end of the race, things equalize. May not be on a specific race. You know, some specific super speedway races, teams struggle and they just can't get it done. But over the course of all the decades of super speedway racing, in the mo for the most part, the small teams still have a pretty solid chance. And I wouldn't disregard a team. I mean, other than, I mean, even Carl Long cars are in play. They're stretch, but we have seen Carl put together some. I mean, he used to put together decent super speedway cars, and you get some solid finishes out of Jeff Green. Well, Green was running for C a lot of times. But we would see, you know, Timmy Hill or somebody pop up. The stretch, but it's very hard to eliminate anyone from your field. And Red Slide, 29% optimal. But again, he's the perfect example of a driver that I like because has he been optimal as much? No, still not bad. I mean, obviously it's good. He's up towards the top. But the 29% may not be appealing to some. Although that number is pretty good, or really appealing to me based on my theory and my principles, 75% of the time he is getting a top 10 DFS score. If the goal is winning lineups, and this guy's hitting 75% of the time, ranks number one in terms of top 10s at Daytona and Talladega, then yes, please sign me up. Now, again, you might be looking at why is I'm not factoring in Atlanta into this one for, for whatever reason. Sorry. My apologies. I could factor in the Atlanta data for Austin Hill. 27% of the time, top 10 DFS. Obviously, that's going to be higher. You throw the Atlanta numbers in. I should probably put in the Atlanta numbers. I have not My apologies. I am sorry. We'll work on that today, maybe. Moving down our list, we got Riley Herbst, 27%. And the drivers that we see, for the most part, optimal-wise, are all pretty much the same. Herbst, Sieg with fewer racers. That's Kyle. Joey Gase, actually, quite a few plate races under his belt, and he's hit quite a few times. Not bad. And it is worth mentioning because sometimes we worry about the Gase Emerling cars. Now, some of these stats are when he was in better rides. So you would want to go a little more specific, but I still think that his car will be fine in this race. Ryan Truex, smaller sample size, but still 20% of the time, 25% top 10. Brennan Poole. 20% opto, 40% top 10. Cole Custer, 19%, 44% top 10, which is interesting because when we look at Cole Custer and some of the big name drivers, they tend not to hit in optimal lineups and they tend not to hit the top 10 DFS scoreboard because they start closer to the front. And as you see, most of these names are mid-pack guys. Drivers that are going to be starting closer to the rear. Drivers that are going to have the opportunity to score place differential points. That's not afforded to the drivers in the top tier equipment that typically start up front. And so if you're always starting up front, you may be finishing up front, but you're not scoring fantasy points. Thus, you're not in the top 10. Thus, you're not in the optimal lineup. So you don't score as many top 10s or optimal appearances. Your percentage goes down. And to see Cole Custer actually pop up is kind of intriguing. It's interesting. Brian Ellis, Jeremy Clements, now you're seeing Allgaier, like 
tons of races, obviously 22, but only 25% of the time is he scoring a top 10 in DFS. And that's just goes more of the same that we just talked about. Allgaier more than likely to start closer to the front. He can have a very solid super speedway race. He's a pretty good super speedway racer, but we don't worry about, are you good at super speedways as much as can you score fantasy points? Have you scored fantasy points? And Allgaier only a quarter of the time. And that just makes him particularly unappealing. Unless, of course, we can get him starting back end of the teens, closer to 20th, then yes, he becomes playable. And that's why he has at least a 27% rank in terms of top 10 DFS score. But as he gets closer to the front, based on the data, we would say that this is more likely one of the days where he could have a good race. But three quarters of the time, it's not a top 10 DFS score. So you can make that decision pretty easily Friday night after the live stream saying, oh, Olgar is starting 11th. I don't really need to go there. Could he be optimal from that spot? Yes. But will he be in the winning lineup? Yeah, he could be in the winning lineup too. But do I need him to build the winning lineup? No. And if the quarter of the time he's not really a winning lineup top guy, or three quarters of the time, then I likely don't need to make that pick. And I would rather go with someone who statistically is scoring a top 10 DFS score more often and has a higher probability. I want to get the odds on my side. Ryan C, 42% of the time gets you a top 10, 16% optimal. We probably should just look at the top 10. There is your optimal names. And the other thing is, like, look, we're seeing basically every mid-pack team from JD Motorsports to Alpha Prime slash TJM. Tojo, Tommy Joe Martins, the Emperor, even Caesar Baccarella. You'll notice I use the Caesar Baccarella. I just like the way that car looks. That's the thumbnail, and he's bringing a nice little sweet hot rod. I always love the Travis Pastrama, Pastrama car. He didn't have any sponsors. Looks like that hurting, but man, that car was wicked. Splashy, flashy. I miss that thing in the Xfinity series. I miss Travis. Come on back, Travis. Made a couple of spot appearances in the truck series over the last couple of years he's pretty much gone doing his own thing let's find what lasted but now caesar is running the miami vice car i guess as we would call it those neon blues and pinks hot pink hot blue um i don't know what the name of that miami architecture i used to know like i'm blanking now those hot collars gotta love it feel like a little bit of sp- Flash of Miami and Talladega. I love that car. That's why it's a thumbnail. He's got another one coming this week. Can't help but root for it. And look, Senior's not bad. 15% of the time, but then almost 20% of the time. Not my favorite, but he's crept in some optimal lineups. And it's kind of beguiling to watch him race at times. Like, oh, God, he just, this is not his day. It's more of a sports car guy. It's really just a hobby for him. He's got some money. And then he hops in. Rinse this ride out every time a super speedway comes around. Well, prior to him, he's living the life. And he's named Caesar. Come on, man. You're Caesar, Miami, hobby sports car. Boy, that's a life. I just need to sell about 10,000 more spreadsheets. And then I'm not even anywhere close. <laughs> not anywhere close. Hey, Caesar, if you're listening, man, come on, let's go party. I'll come on down to Miami. I'll go down to South Beach. We'll have some fun. He's not listening. 6 a.m. Thursday morning, April 18th. He's still partying. He might not be partying this week. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's at Talladega already partying. I don't know if that's really his scene, though. Talladega infield, Caesar scene. I don't know, maybe changes it up, you know. Maybe he brings the party with him. I could see him and Pitbull really getting down. Times are changing, guys. It's a new NASCAR. Mr. Worldwide, Cesar Baccarella. Chandler Smith, again, his numbers in terms of top of DFS, not going to be the greatest because he's starting up front. Although he is in and has been in a colored car for his five races, or, well, four of them. And he should have pretty good results, but he ain't A.J. Allmendinger. And so he's likely starting up front, just not scoring the fantasy points, even if he does finish. And I don't think Smith has been actually particularly good 
at the super speedway. It's not that you would cross them off based on that. You just cross them off because you're starting too close to the front. Fast Pasta, Anthony Alfredo, Alf, Tony Cheese, whatever you want to call him, Tony's Pizza. Gotta love Tony's Pizza. Here we go. Let's talk about food again. How he doesn't eat crap food anymore. Gotta love Tony's Pizza. DiGiorno's the best. DiGiorno, frozen pizza. I've been experimenting, trying to find the healthy pizza options. Spoiler alert, there are no healthy pizza options. I guess there's pizza that is less bad for you. Trying to explore some of those. I think uh, I might try the ultra thin DiGiorno if I can find that in the store. Be kind of neat. Although, when you get a DiGiorno Coleman, you got to get the rising crust. I know, but man, that thing is. Used to live on that. I still remember. Man, it was Friday nights with my dad. He'd rent three videos, VHS from the video store. Kids, actually, most of the people that listen are around 30 and 40. So you guys remember video stores. You probably remember me talking about that. I used to work at a video store. Far low, getting the three videos, pop in the DiGiorno, hanging out with my dad. I remember watching Fargo for the first time, munching on DiGiorno. Probably a little young to be watching Fargo, but it was awesome. Fell in love with the Coen brothers. Cool, nice story time here on the Fantasy NASCAR podcast. People are going to get mad. You can see the numbers on your screen if you don't mind me talking about it. Last but not least, I will mention, I have recently had Dayton-style crust from Dayton, Ohio. I don't know if I mentioned this before on the pizza, pizza podcast. This is not the pizza podcast. On the podcast, I've fallen in love with it. I guess Marion's is the most famous. I got uh, King Cassano's, which is right there next to him. And it's Cracker Crust. And I believe uh, St. Louis does a Cracker Crust too, but they do more of a tavern cut, whereas Cassano's does these small little cuts. He says it just makes it better. A little bite-sized pizza crust that make it less flimsy, and uh, they salt it up. It's great. Dayton-style pizza. Check it out, Dayton, Ohio. See if we're going to have to get into there. Back to the podcast. Brandon Jones, 22. Races, 27% of the time. Top 10. Again, what we really are seeing are these mid-pack drivers are the ones that we want to target. And let's sort it by top 10s to illustrate that point that we really want to put our focus and attention on the top of the mid pack or even the middle of the mid pack. That's where we want to go. Those are the drivers that are significant. And for the most part, as we see the teams, basically they're all having success. There isn't one mid pack team that we say, oh, we can't play that team. Alpha Prime's on the board. BJ McLeod is even on the board, even though I don't think they're going to have Xfinity cars anymore. Daughter is on the board. Jordan Anderson, Our Motorsports, AM Racing. They are all going to be teams that we are focusing most of our attention on. And we're not going to really focus too much on JGR and on Hendrick and on Haas. We won't completely eliminate them, but it's a super speedway week. And we worry about those guys during regular weeks, not so much this week. This week, we're looking at Smithley's in a JD car, Gase in the Gase Mobile, Sieg Mobiles, Parker Kligerman. Although his is probably top tier equipment now with Big Machine, but you know, it's different this week. He doesn't really have a winning chance on normal weeks. He can win this week. And so if he starts in the teens, we know that he can finish top five and he can get there. But I don't want to play Parker Kligerman if he's starting too close to the front. Brennan Poole, years with JD, years with a bunch of different teams, now mainly with Alpha Prime, he'll be fine. Alfredo, back with Auer, fine. Siegs, fine. And they've bought some pretty good Super Speedway cars over the years. Ellis, 33% of the time, getting a top 10 percentage. Jeb Burton, now he does have some inflated stats with Colleg, but he also has raced well for Jordan Anderson. Got a win at a Super Speedway for Jordan Anderson. We're seeing a couple of these top tier guys start to slide in here. Jeff Earnhardt, Creed, there it all is. Hopefully this has been a little bit helpful. I know we just talked about pizza the whole time. Probably worst podcast yet. That's okay. They don't all have to be bangers. The data's on the screen. Help people out at the very least. So if you don't want to listen to me talk about stupid stuff, you can always just mute me. Um, and I really appreciate that you're here still. So like, subscribe, share. Think about getting that May package. Um, really am blessed that you'll listen to me talk about pizza and watching Fargo with my dad. 
miss that date sometimes, all the times. And so I, I appreciate you guys, really do. I am truly blessed that you'll stick with me with the stupid stuff that I say. Love you guys. Trip to life fantastic.